Good evening and welcome to Holden Evening Prayer, beautiful Savior Lutheran Church. Holden is not a setting, it's actually a place. It is a retreat center up in the high mountains of central Washington. It is one of those places that is a destination because you're not going to find it just by driving around. Most of us know it as a beautiful Advent service. But it also is a community from which we can learn from as we seek to na navigate our preparations for Christmas, as well as how do we operate as a community in general. There are some things that we learn from it. Its mission is growing from the love of Christ. Holden Village is a courageous community that welcomes all people into the wilderness to form and renew their relationships with God, the earth, and each other. It is a gift and an invitation to build and practice community within the village and in the greater world. They value their place in the wilderness, their Lutheran heritage, community building. Are you noticing a repeated emphasis and the rhythms of village life. And so they commit to a number of different things. And this evening I'm going to raise up the fact that they are a community where questions are valued and encouraged. Wow, what a thought. And so as we begin this day, welcome into this space where there may not be time for questions in this space but we come together in the presence of a God who can handle questions. Let us begin our worship. Jesus Christ, you are the light of the world. us now for it is evening and the day is almost over let your light scatter darkness and shine within your people here joyous light Let 
Blessed are you, creator of the universe. From old you have led your people by night and day. May the night of your Christ make our darkness bright. For your word and your presence are the light of our pathways, and you are the light and life of all creation. May our prayers come before you, O God, as incense, and may your presence surround and fill us so that in union with all creation, we might sing your praise and your love in our lives. Amen. From Matthew 11. When John heard in prison that what the Messiah was doing, he sent word by his disciples and said to him, Are you the one who is to come, or are we to wait for another? Jesus answered them, Go and tell John what you hear and see. The blind receive their sight, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, and the poor have good news brought to them. And blessed is anyone who takes no offense at me. As they went away, Jesus began to speak to the crowds about John. What did you go out into the wilderness to look at? A reed shaken by the wind? What then did you go out to see? Someone dressed in soft robes? Look, those who wear soft robes are in royal palaces. What then did you go out to see? A prophet? Yes, I tell you, and more than a prophet. This is the one about whom it is written. See, I am sending my messenger ahead of you who will prepare your way before you. Truly, I tell you, that among those born of women, no one has arisen greater than John the Baptist, yet the least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. The light shines in the darkness, 
and the darkness has not overcome it. Questions. Questions. I remember in my earlier life when I was training to be a teacher, one of the things that was mentioned to me by my, one of my professors was, we have a tendency to change children. They enter as question marks and they leave as periods. I wonder if we do the same thing with faith, where we say that faith is knowing. I know, therefore. Well, let's face it. It's amazing how what one person knows can be used as a weapon to make someone else not want to know. One of the questions you may ask yourself in this community is, Pastor, why are you on the other side of the church from us? It must be with COVID, right? No. This is about our kids at our academy getting ready for their performance and their practices. So things end up a little different because we are trying to create space for the children. And one of the most amazing things that the children bring to us, and honestly I think we need to carry with us, is the gift of questions. But I'm sure we've all had those experiences with two-year-olds, three-year-olds, four-year-olds. What's this? What's that? Why? Why? How? What? Martin Luther, when he came up with his small catechism, which was designed for households to teach themselves and the children the faith, he wrote that book with a statement of, you know, whatever part of, here's one of the commandments, or here's a portion of the Apostles' Creed, or a portion of the Lord's Prayer, and then a statement that, was began, that began with, what does this mean? In the original German, was ist das? Martin Luther, at the time he came up with the small catechism, had a three-year-old in the house. And a little child shall lead them. Jesus said, truly I tell you, unless you have faith like one of these little ones, you will not see the kingdom of heaven. But how often do little ones come with questions? Do we think that God can't handle questions? Jesus was asked this question that it goes right to the heart of everything, doesn't it? Are you the one we're waiting for? Or are we to wait for another? This is a core identity question. And notice that Jesus didn't get all egoed up and go, how dare you, smite. He just said, take this back to John, basically. What do you see and what do you hear? And he lists off all of these things that he's doing. Do we value questions or not? Sometimes I think we're afraid of them. I know for me, one of my biggest struggles in life was anything that had dealt with my core ego. It felt like a challenge. It sometimes was received as a failure to present myself. But if we're honest, questions make us aware. Questions from others make us realize what they're receiving or not what they're understanding or not. 
But do we also understand that the question is a moment of vulnerability? In a world, in a culture that seems to value more and more certainty, repeat it often enough and people will believe it. It doesn't matter if it's true. It doesn't have to be right. Just keep shouting it loudly. Someone actually stopping and asking a question is a moment of vulnerability. It's an admission that they're seeking something they don't already have. And they're trusting you to give them an answer. What would the world be like if we stayed curious and not judgmental? What would it be like if we take this commitment of Holden into our lives and into our practices, into our congregations, into our homes, into our communities? A willingness to ask a question and not just start with a period or an exclamation mark. What could God do with us if we stay open to what God is actually doing? If we don't assume we have all the answers to start with. The seminary I attended, the Lutheran School of Theology of Chicago, its motto when I joined them was, where all your answers are questioned. That was a challenge and a half. But also made it possible for me to be able to to hear questions that came to me. As we prepare for Christmas, what questions can we bring? What questions can we honor? In this season of preparation, if we come with a question and an openness to learn and to hear and a little bit of vulnerability, what might we see? What might we learn? What might we notice about this amazing season that we've overlooked for reasons of, well, we know it all. It's the same story. It's the same situation. It's the same hymns. It's the same carols. What would it mean to come with questions? to honor the questions that are within you, to honor the questions that are in people around you. To honor that greatest question of all that we always bring to our Lord. What does this mean for me? May we be surprised and blessed by the answers that enter into that space. And remember that God loves you, and so do I. Amen. town called Nazareth to a woman whose name was Mary. The angel said to her, Rejoice, O highly favored, for God is with you. You 
shall bear a child, and his name shall be Jesus, the chosen one of God most high. And Mary said, I am a servant of my God. I live to do your will. My soul proclaims your greatness, O God, and my spirit rejoices in you. You have looked with love on your servant here, and blessed me all my life through. Great and mighty are you, O Holy One, strong is your kindness evermore. How you favor the weak and lowly one, humbling the proud of heart. You have cast the mighty down from their thrones and uplifted the humble of heart. You have filled the hungry with wondrous things and left the wealthy no part. Great and mighty are you, O faithful one. Strong is your justice, strong your love. As you promised to Sarah and Abraham, kindness forevermore. My soul proclaims your greatness, O God, and my spirit rejoices in you. You have looked with love on your servant here and blessed me all my life through. Oh. Uh-huh. 
us all of our days. Keep us hold us gracious God. Great and merciful God, source and ground of all goodness and life, give to your people the peace that surpasses all understanding and the will to live your gospel of mercy and justice through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Jesus gathered at a table with his disciples in Jerusalem that last night. It was a Seder meal, Passover meal. In the tradition, the Passover begins when the youngest member of the family asks the oldest male of the family, what makes this night special? And thus begins a meal that is also a story to answer the question, what makes this night special? At that table with his disciples, there were lots of questions. What's all going on? What's really going to happen? What do you mean someone's going to betray you? Is it I? Lots of questions. And Jesus reminds us in John that he's going to send an advocate, a comforter. Not in the sense of a there, 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 you don't need to worry about any of these questions, but a reminder of the fact that there is more to come. In fact, he says that there is much more that I wish to teach you, but you're not ready for it yet. One of our fellow Christian churches, fellow denominations, They've adopted a symbol of their faith, the comma. The sentence isn't done. There isn't a period. There's still more. As we gather around this table, we know that there is more. There is more to come. Some awful, horrendous things that will happen that following day to Jesus some of the worst things that humanity could ever do to a fellow human being. And we're left with the question, is that it? And then the celebration of Easter Sunday reminds us, nope, there's more to come. As we're in this season of Christmas and we might expect a certain kind of coming of the Lord, may we stay open with a question mark to receive our Savior as a baby born to an unwed teen mom who had no place to go but the place where they kept the animals. May we stay open and questioning as to where our Lord may, we may find our Lord, and we might be surprised. And so, as we gather around this table, we remember on the night in which our Savior was betrayed, he took bread, he blessed it and broke it, gave it for us to eat, said, take and eat all of you. This is my body. It's broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And after supper, he took the cup. After giving thanks, he gave it for all to drink, saying, Take and drink. This cup contains the blood of the new covenant shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this in remembrance of me. And so, dear Lord, even as we gather around you with so many questions, may we receive this gift, this food, this reminder, this promise, this blessing, you. And may it strengthen us and feed us so we can continue to follow 
continue to learn, continue to grow, and rise again in newness of life by the gift of the Holy Spirit, so that all may proclaim Almighty God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. God, remember us in your love and teach us to pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. This is a gift for each and every one of us, no matter where we are in our journey and where we are with God, because it's his gift to us to feed us as we continue to walk and follow and learn and grow and ask questions. For communion, you'll be invited to come down the center aisle. Uh, I'll meet you at the uh, end of the last pew here. I have gluten-free wafers, so you, anybody can take it without concern, I would hope. Uh, then I, have, I will have a, tra a tray on a stand that'll be right by the Advent wreath for you to take a you know, glass of uh, grape juice or a glass of wine as you so need. There are a couple of little stands with little bowls for you to put the empty cups in. There's also a couple of spaces left and right up here up front for you to spend some time, light some candles and prayer and reflection as you so desire. The gifts that God gives us to feed us on our way. Come and receive.
let us bless our God. Praise and thanks to you. May God, Creator, bless us and keep us. May Christ be ever light for our lives. May the Spirit of love